Hello and welcome to this video on theories of the family, functionalism and Marxism. Sociologists are interested in the role and purpose of families. Often it is said that the family is the linchpin or the keystone or indeed the foundation of society. And often sociologists will ask, what are the functions of the family? They are also interested in how the family fits into wider society, so its relationship with other institutions. There are a range of different perspectives we need to consider, and firstly we're going to look at functionalism followed by Marxism. Functionalism is a consensus perspective. This means that broadly it is of the opinion that society is based on an agreement, that we have come together in a consensus, that we agree as individuals on certain things. It is the view that society is a system of interrelated and interdependent units, and these are held together by a social glue known as a shared value consensus. So, these different units will be different institutions, such as education, religion, the media, the government, and of course the family. And each of these units will have a relationship with each other and will rely upon each other. This shared value consensus is an agreement about what is important in society. So we have shared norms and values into which all members of society are socialised. You are taught them from an early age. This helps to meet society's needs and goals. We need these different institutions to be performing different functions and that helps society operate in an optimum way and fulfills everyone's needs within society. Different spheres perform different functions which allow society to operate. So education performs one function, the family performs another and the media will perform another one and so on and so on and so on. In the sense, therefore, it has been said by functionalists that society is similar to the body, because in the body we have different organs and they are all interrelated and interdependent and they need each other and they rely upon each other. Uh, and without one of those, there's the possibility that the body could die. And so society is similar. We need all of these institutions to perform their functions, otherwise society may begin to wither and we could begin to see the beginnings of anomy or normlessness. Our first functionalist that we need to consider is George Murdoch and his work, and he identified four major functions that he believed the family performs. Firstly, stable satisfaction of the sex drive. That's the idea that mum and dad or husband and wife, because he's going to be focusing here on a heterosexual couple, have engaged in a monogamous sexual relationship, that is, they only have sex with each other, to the exclusion of all others. And he believed that was a positive thing because it prevents conflict in society if people were having multiple sexual partners, for example. So mum and dad will only have sex with each other, and that's how they satisfy their sex drives. Secondly, from this you will have the reproduction of the next generation. So literally, having babies, having children, ensures that society continues and doesn't just die out after a single generation. Next we have socialisation of the young, so once the babies have been born, mum and dad are going to socialise them into the shared value consensus of society, teaching them norms and values. Finally, meeting its members' economic needs, so every member of the family will have certain needs, and primarily, as we're about to see, it's going to be dad who's going to be the breadwinner, earning the money to provide for everyone's economic needs. So these are Murdoch's four major functions of the family. However, Murdoch has been criticised on many levels. Firstly, Marxists and feminists who take a more conflict view would argue that Murdoch's harmonious consensus view of the family is rose-tinted. That is to say it's too positive. It makes it sound as if all these functions are being performed perfectly, it's all working, there's no issues, no conflicts, and in reality, human life and indeed life in families can be a little bit more difficult than that. It fails to consider exploitation and conflict. So it could be the case that, as Marxists would say, the family is simply existing to serve the needs of capitalism. They are being exploited by most likely the bourgeoisie and that they are essentially in conflict, class conflict uh, with the bourgeoisie. This is, of course, assuming that this family is a member of the proletariat. For feminists, they would argue that the family exists to serve 
the needs of patriarchy and that within the family, uh, dad or the male partner is likely to dominate and indeed exploit his wife for her labour, for her domestic labour in home. So that's the childcare, that is the cooking and the cleaning and so forth. And so these criticisms have been levied at Murdoch's thesis. Our next key sociologist is Talcott Parsons, and he builds on the work of George Murdoch. Parsons believed that the functions the family performs will depend on the kind of society in which it is found. So that is to say that, to an extent, the family, its functions, its shape and structure will mirror the society in which it is based. The functions that the family has to perform will affect its shape and structure. So you may have a larger or smaller family, depending on the functions it needs to perform. Parsons identified two types of family structure. Firstly, the nuclear family. This is where we generally have mum and dad in a heterosexual monogamous relationship, married with dependent children. And it's a fairly small type of family. Parsons also identified the extended family. This is where you have three generations living together under one roof. So, for example, grandma, grandpa, mum, dad, and some children. Three generations under one roof, and so it is a much larger family. The family will fit society, Parsons argued. So, depending on the type of society you have, you will have a different type of family. Parsons identifies two types of society, pre-industrial, where we tend to find extended families, and modern industrial, where we find nuclear families. In the pre-industrial society, most people worked on farms in rural areas, that is the countryside. They primarily were agricultural workers making food or growing food or tending crops or sheep with a view to ultimately selling that so that they could keep some for themselves and make some money in preparation for next year's harvest. As a result, the families needed to be very large to be able to work large pieces of land, hence an extended family. Whereas in a modern industrial society, we no longer needed extended families. Instead, much smaller families were required, families that could quite easily sort of move as necessary, maybe around the country, in order to follow where the jobs were. So it was an economic imperative that changed the shape of the family. So as Britain industrialised from the late 1800s onwards, the extended family gave way to the nuclear family. Different needs therefore meant that we needed different family structures. We didn't need the large families to work the land as we had in the past. Instead, we needed small families that lived in cities and could move or be geographically mobile to wherever there might be work within the country. The nuclear family therefore fits the needs of industrial society and the extended family fitted the needs of pre-industrial society. Let's do a bit of a comparison then. So in traditional pre-modern society, the extended family was the dominant family type. People lived in the same villages and worked on the same land, often for all of their lives. The extended family lived and worked together. They support each other and serve the functions of caring for the young and elderly, educating family members and looking after the home, collecting food, etc. You had several generations living together, and in some circumstances, this could cause conflict. So having so many people living together uh, and working in such close proximity together could cause you know, strife to occur. It was also harder to move an extended family to another village or to another part of the country because it was much larger. So having to uproot such a large number of people sometimes caused problems. Whereas in modern industrial society, the nuclear family is the dominant family type. People need to move to where the jobs are, and so the nuclear family is easier to move than the extended family. The nuclear family is best suited for social mobility as children move out of home when they marry and form their own nuclear families. And this is important because it prevents that conflict. There's no fear that, say, a son is going to get a better job perhaps than his father and therefore conflict could occur between son and father. Instead, because son has moved out and now is, in a sense, the head of his own household, focusing on the nuclear family here, therefore we're less likely to see that conflict occur. 
The nuclear family sees a loss of functions of the family. The nuclear family no longer work together. Schools and health services had led to the loss of functions of the family. So actually, the nuclear family lost a lot of its roles, the roles that the extended family had in the past. And as we see here, other institutions have picked those up. Parsons talked about the needs of these different types of societies and how the family needed to adapt to meet these needs. He talked about the need for, firstly, a geographically mobile workforce. The compact nuclear family is ideal for moving around for work. It is not rooted to farmland, as we saw with extended families in traditional pre-industrial societies. Secondly, a socially mobile workforce. Individuals acquire their status based on their achievement in a industrial society, such as our own, and this is known as meritocracy, rather than being an ascribed status given to you at birth. The nuclear family prevents potential conflicts in the family home. For example, as previously mentioned, a son having a higher status than his father at work, which could cause issues. The modern nuclear family specialises in performing two essential or irreducible functions. So Parsons has taken Murdoch's four functions and boiled it down to two. Firstly, the primary socialisation of children. To equip them with basic skills and society's values, to enable them to cooperate with others and begin to integrate them into society. So this is one of the key things that the family does, giving children the things they need to truly engage with society, to become completely evolved and to become completely part of the society they have been brought up in. Next, the stabilisation of adult personalities. Adults can relax, support each other and release tensions within the family, allowing them to return to the workplace refreshed. This is functional for the efficiency of the economy. So dad, in this instance, as the breadwinner, needs to be able to return home and have the opportunity to have his adult personality stabilised. And this is firstly going to be done through leisure time, spending time with his family and primarily with his wife. But also, to an extent, there is going to be a sexual element here again. The fact that husband and wife engage in a sexually monogamous relationship means that they are helping each other, supporting each other and satisfying each other's sex drives. So two key irreducible functions there. However, there is some evidence against the work of Parsons. And so therefore, you're going to need to turn to page 190 in your textbook and then read box 30 whilst making notes of the criticisms of Parsons' theory. Once you've done that, could you consider this question? Which do you think is the strongest criticism and why? And we will discuss this in our lesson. So general criticisms of the functionalist view are that functionalists tend to ignore the dark side of the family, such as male dominance within the household, child abuse, and conflict between partners, e.g. domestic violence. Functionalists ignore the diversity of family types now found within society. They tend to focus exclusively on the nuclear family and, of course, make reference to an extended family. Parsons' views of the family have been criticised as being sexist, as he sees the wife or mother as having the main responsibility for providing warmth and emotional support and for de-stressing her hard-working husband. So wives or women in general are reduced simply to the housewife or homemaker role. Her primary job is simply to ensure that her husband or partner is happy, that he is relaxed, that he is being fed, that the children are looked after, the house is clean and so on. And we know that this is no longer really relevant in contemporary society, where increasingly the vast majority of women go out and are earners, and in some situations are now the main breadwinner. And we're also seeing women start to break through that glass ceiling. And so women's role is no longer primarily that of homemaker. It does not necessarily fit our contemporary society. Next, we're going to consider the Marxist perspective of the family, which is a conflict perspective. This is to say that it's of the opinion that fundamentally at the heart of our society, there is a conflict between different groups. And for Marxists, that's going to be between different social classes. Now, it's worth saying from the outset that we need to remember a number of key things about Marxism and ensure that we don't get confused because the nature of Marxism and its focus can sometimes cause some students to get 
slightly confused when they are writing their essay responses or exam question responses. Firstly, Karl Marx, Marxism, his ideology, and Marxists, those who follow him and his perspective, are anti-capitalist. That is to say they dislike capitalism, they want to change capitalism, and in many situations they want to reform or indeed destroy capitalism. The Marxist perspective is a critique of capitalism, it's an evaluation of it. It studies and identifies how capitalism operates. And I believe on occasion it's because of this focus on capitalism that some students can get slightly confused and may think that for some reason Marx and his followers are actually supporting capitalism. They most definitely are not. Marxists ultimately desire the overthrow of capitalism. They want to overthrow the economic system under which we currently live. Marxists see society as based on conflict rather than consensus, as we saw with the functionalists in our earlier slides. The two groups they identify as being in conflict are the proletariat, as exemplified on the left there. These are the workers, the working class. They are in conflict with the bourgeoisie, as exemplified on the right. And they are the landowners, the factory owners, they own the means of production. They are the middle and upper classes. Karl Marx was a German philosopher, thinker, sociologist, economist, amongst many other things. He primarily actually lived in London, although he was born in Germany. He had a very interesting philosophical background and ultimately came to a range of very interesting conclusions. Having studied history and saw how things change over time, in particular moving between different moments in history, and he believed that these were characterised by a sort of economic dimension or a socio economic dimension. He argues that history moves through socio-economic stages or paradigms and we're currently living within capitalism. Previous systems include feudalism, slavery and primitive communism. Capitalism is characterised by property being owned privately by individuals. So you and I, we can own property and by property we're really talking about houses, factories, land and so on rather than say personal effects and artefacts. The other aspect of capitalism that is worth mentioning is the concept of the free market. And this is where producers and consumers of goods and services come together and agree prices for the purchase and selling of those goods and services, and the government does not get involved. The free market. Capitalist society is divided into social classes, as previously stated. The middle and upper classes, as we may refer to them now, although truly there aren't much of the upper class now left, as that was the landed aristocracy and royalty. So the middle classes, or bourgeoisie, own most of the property, and the working classes, everybody else, own little to no property. Now the bourgeoisie, that is the property owning class, the upper and middle classes, exploit the proletariat, the working class, for their labour. The bourgeoisie are the employers who control the means of production. So the, the means of production are the things you need to make stuff, to make goods and services, such as land, factories, machinery, resources, and offices. And they own this, but they cannot run it themselves. And so therefore they need to employ people to work the machines and produce the goods and services for them. And they're going to employ laborers, workers, or the proletariat. They then take the products that the proletariat have made and sell them for a profit. And if we take away from the overall price or the gross price all of the costs of making that product, so that would have been the labourer's wages and also the resources to make it and maybe the maintenance of the machines, what's left over the bourgeoisie keep for themselves. This is known as surplus value. And that surplus value means that slowly but surely over time the bourgeoisie will become richer and richer and richer. And they are not sharing the proceeds of that growth in their own wealth with the proletariat. Instead, they're likely to be keeping them on a low wage, possibly a minimum wage, trying to work them longer hours and in often poorer conditions. The proletariat, however, do not own the means of production and therefore are forced to sell their labour, that is their time, energy, effort and skills. Because they do not own the means of production, they have no other form of income. So they simply have the choice of work and earn or 
do not work and most probably starve and die. It's as stark as that. Work under capitalism, so within this current socio-economic paradigm, is generally poorly paid, unsatisfying, alienating, that is to say that the workers have no ownership or control over the things they produce, and something which the workers do not control. The workers are not deciding their hours, their pay, their holiday, and so on. So because of this, essentially the proletariat are being exploited. They're being exploited for their labour, they are in a difficult position because if they do not labour, they do not eat. So they are ultimately stuck and have to work for the bourgeoisie. And so this creates the potential for these two social classes to come into conflict. Because what we have here is a very small, very powerful capitalist class who owns the means of production and a very large, poor, but politically weak working class. And so slowly but surely, Marx argued, the workers, by virtue of the fact that they live near each other, they work side by side, and they're experiencing such dire situations, are going to start to talk to each other, and they're going to realise their exploitation. They're going to realise that they're being treated poorly. That done, they can start to form what Marx referred to as class consciousness. That is, an awareness that they are a social class, that they are a group, an awareness that they are a large group, an awareness that they are potentially a powerful group, and an awareness that they could, if they wanted to, seize power and change society. Marx thought that they potentially would go down one of two routes when it came to bringing about change. The first was they can bandy together and form trade unions to argue for better wages and conditions. And this has been very successful in the West, and many of the rights that we enjoy as workers in the West are a product of the trade union movement. Everything from the five-day week, the eight-hour working day, the concept of a lunch break, and so on and so forth. These are all the product of trade unionism. Marx, however, wasn't particularly interested in trade unionism. Instead, he was far more radical in his approach. He believed that the workers should seek to abolish capitalism altogether, that they should have a revolution. This would involve overthrowing the bourgeoisie and seizing the means of production. Once they've done that, they can form a worker's state, and this period would be known as a dictatorship of the proletariat. This would then transition to socialism, where slowly but surely all individuals in society would become workers and would share in the common endeavour of society. Each would put in what they need and take out what they require to society's common pot. And then ultimately, this would lead to classlessness, that is an absence of social classes, and therefore we would live under communism. We would have no need for any sort of government. However, as you've probably noticed, we do not live in a communist utopia. Marx had believed that the revolution was imminent in the late 1800s, and sure enough, some revolutions did occur around the world. However, Marx believes that they had to be global and simultaneous, and this did not happen. And this is partially because capitalism is very resilient, it's very dynamic, it's very good at adapting itself to the needs of society, and indeed the needs of its own economy. But it's also partly due to the fact that the bourgeoisie, that is the middle classes, control state power. And by controlling state power, this allows them to maintain their position of power and privilege. Focusing now on the Marxist perspective of the family, Marxists identify three main functions of the family. The first is the inheritance of property. Marx believed that prior to slavery, which is a previous socio-economic paradigm, humans lived in what he referred to as a primitive communism. So we're thinking in here about early man, when man first started bandying together, when we formed sort of clans and tribes, Everyone lived and worked together. We shared everything. We shared tools, we shared clothing, we shared food. And by that virtue, it was a form of communism. It was a form of classlessness. Everyone giving what they could, taking what they need. But it was primitive. It was basic, the most basic of human societal forms. Marx's friend, Friedrich Engels, argued that during this time, humans lived in a promiscuous horde. That is to say, we were not monogamous. It wasn't one man, one woman engaging in a relationship. There was no concept of marriage. Instead, 
everyone fulfilled their sexual needs with each other. The ultimate aim was to have as many children as possible so that the clan or tribe could continue. Without children, the clan or tribe would die. And so there was no concept of monogamy. As the forces of production developed, however, that is to say, as we became better at producing things, so making more tools, making better clothes, making more food, and so on, so did the concept of private property, the idea that we might own things privately rather than share everything in a communism. And so the need for patriarchal monogamous family developed. And this was because fathers wanted to know that it was their sons that they were passing their property onto at the time of their death. So no longer was it acceptable to live in a promiscuous horde. The concept of marriage was created. Men wanted to know, and by this point men were exerting their dominance over women, that their children were their own, were their own flesh and blood, so to speak. And so they would marry them, and rules and taboos were created to ensure that wives would remain faithful, and that were, therefore meant that any babies born would be the father's children. And then when father died, all of his property would then be inherited by his own son. So this is how the family performs the inheritance of property function, according to Marxists. The second major function of the family that Marxists identify is the ideological function. Children are socialised into hierarchy, leading them to believe that subordination to power is legitimate. So if we think about the nuclear family, to an extent, parents are like a petty or small bourgeoisie, and children are like a petty or small proletariat. And that is because the children have to defer to the bourgeoisie, that is their parents, have to do as they're told. And this is a practice for later life when in the workplace they will defer to the actual bourgeoisie, that is the property owners, the landowners, the factory owners, their bosses at work. And this system therefore, starting at home and socialising children this way, leads children to believe that doing this or behaving this way towards more powerful individuals is normal, acceptable and righteous. It is practice for living under capitalism. It causes bourgeois power to appear natural and unchanging. It makes it appear normal that there should be a leader or there should be a more empowered class or group above oneself. And therefore, children do not ask questions when later in life they experience this, as we will see in education, but also in the workplace. The home also acts as a haven or safe space from the exploitation of capitalism. It is a place where the suffering of the worker is soothed. And this was Eli Zaretsky's concept. He put forward the idea that essentially if we imagine dad as the worker coming home to his house where his wife has prepared a nice meal and has put the children to bed and is going to give him a massage and maybe run him a bath, this is going to make the worker think, well, I've had a really difficult day, my boss was horrible to me, but it's not that bad. As long as I've got my nice home, my wife and my children, what more could I possibly want? And so the worker does not focus on the nature of his exploitation. The worker simply thinks, this is enough I'm happy. And so the exploitation continues and the family continues to perform an ideological function for capitalism. The final function is the family is a unit of consumption. And this is a big change from the days in which the family was a unit of production. As we saw pre-capitalism in feudalism, where the majority of people worked the land and produced their own goods as they needed them. Capitalism exploits the labour of workers, selling what they produce for more than they are paid to produce these goods. The family is then a target as a unit which consumes goods. And again, this is Zaretsky. So if we imagine the family is the target of many advertising companies who are seeking to sell goods because families consume goods. They buy cleaning products, they buy clothes, they buy food, they buy furniture, they buy holidays. And so advertising companies that work for capitalist businesses want to sell them their products. So they are a target as a unit of consumption. Advertisers urge families to compete via consumption. This is known as conspicuous consumption or keeping up with the Joneses. And it's exemplified in the concept of 
if a family were to buy a brand new family car and they had it on their drive and the next door neighbor came home and looked over and saw that there was a really nice car, they may think to themselves, oh, we need to get a brand new car as well because otherwise everyone will think we're poor. And so he goes in and says to his wife, "Why right, we're buying a brand new car. And there we have it. They go buy a brand new car, irrelevant of whether or not they needed it. And they may even buy a slightly nicer car than the next door neighbors, the Joneses, because they were trying to keep up with them and indeed maybe even surpass them. Who profits? Well, ultimately, the capitalist class profit because they've just sold two brand new cars and kept the profit or the surplus value as a result. We also find media target children to pester their parents for money to buy goods and services. And this is exemplified where if we watch Saturday morning television on terrestrial channels, what we often find is on Saturday mornings, it is wall to wall advertisements for children's toys, especially around Christmas time. These children will then turn to their parents and say, mommy, daddy, I need these toys. And mum and dad will often feel that they have to provide them. Otherwise, they might be seen as bad parents. Once again, the capitalist class profits. Finally, children who lack the latest gadgets are stigmatized by their peers at school. So if a children don't, if a children don't have a mobile phone, an iPad or some other sort of device, but also if they don't have maybe the latest trainers or clothing, this could mean that they are bullied at school. And so parents seeking to protect their children will often fork out for all the things that they feel their child requires in this respect. So the family is a unit of consumption. It consumes goods or services which the bourgeoisie are selling and making profit from. Some final criticisms, therefore, of the Marxist view. Marxists tend to assume the nuclear family is dominant in capitalist society, which once again, and this is quite similar to functionalists, ignores family diversity. We now live in a society where family diversity is the norm, and we have lots of different types of families, and increasingly the nuclear family is a minority in terms of types of families in society. Feminists argue that the focus on social class and capitalism ignores gender inequalities, that instead we perhaps should consider the inequality between men and women and how men dominate women within a patriarchal society. And so feminists are arguing here that the family primarily serves men or patriarchy rather than capitalism. Finally, functionalists. Functionalists would argue that Marxists ignore the benefits that the family provides for its members. So again, taking a more positive view, many people love their families and enjoy being with their families. And we can argue that the family performs very important functions for its members. And Marxists tend to ignore these with a view to seeing it through the, lens of the or lenses of a more conflict perspective. That's it. Thank you very much.